Mahaba po yung introduction kasi po matanda na po ako. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you so much, my God. Um, I have been so looking forward to speak to the UP Law graduating class of 2023. First, congratulations. Congratulations to you. I've spent a lot of time with lawyers since 2016. Um, it is the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, from the Nobel Prize, who did I take with me? My lawyer, Keelan Gallagher KC. Uh, at the Vatican, for the World Declaration of Human Fraternity, it was UP Law graduate and my lawyer, John Molo. When I was arrested for the first time, first on the scene at Rappler office was UP Law graduate Darwin Angeles. My first call after my first subpoena was to the former Philippine Stock Exchange President Francis Lim. And when I got my first guilty verdict on June 15, 2020, standing next to me was my lawyer, also a TOIM awardee in my class, but he was the former Supreme Court spokesman, UP Law graduate, Teddy Te. When our board directors, when President Duterte attacked Rappler, I lost three of my, my board members in Rappler. One of the ones who stepped up to take us at the worst of times is a graduate, a Dean, Tony Lavinia. So you can see that I've actually probably, since 2016, spent more time with lawyers than I have with journalists. It's interesting. I've learned so much from them. I learned so much from you. How you think, how you argue, how you try to deal with a quickly changing landscape and interpretations of the law when we are all both, my lawyer and I and Rappler, surrounded by fear, uncertainty, chaos. You're becoming a lawyer at a time when the world is slipping towards fascism, when democracy is on decline, 15 years in a row. That's from Freedom House. Last year, 60% of the world, according to VDEM in Sweden, was under authoritarian rule. This year, this January, that number, 60%, went up to 72%. In Hong Kong, we watched, we cheered, as Hong Kongers demonstrated. First, remember the Umbrella Revolution, and then in 2019, while our streets were empty, we watched our institutions crumble. We saw thousands of Hong Kongers turning into millions who demonstrated daily. In response, China introduced a new security law around the same time we did. And overnight, Hong Kong's legal system changed. The law changed. Its police began a brutal suppression and then jailed every pro-democracy supporter. My friend Jimmy Lai, whose Apple Daily was actually far larger than some of the largest American news groups than CNN, than Washington Post, than the New York Times, he not only saw hundreds of police storm his newsroom and shut it down, he's now in jail. You're becoming a lawyer. After the winds of power shut down, the largest news organization in the Philippines, a news group I led for six years, ABS-CBN. You're becoming a lawyer when a politician, part of a feudal dynasty, a warlord with a private army, is declared a terrorist. It's a slippery slope when power redefines and cuts corners. Who gets caught next? You're becoming a lawyer. When a court separated a newborn baby from her mother, 
in jail for alleged possession of firearms and explosives, which she claims were planted. Her baby dies. Authorities cut that mother's two days for her baby's funeral to six hours. The tragedy of that day, this woman in full white PPE, gloves, mask, still haunts me today. Especially after that activist was acquitted of all charges. Where's justice? So, welcome to the battlefield. You are joining a profession that is at the front line of shaping our societies. The rule of law, justice, and truth are intertwined like a delicate tapestry, and it is now within your very capable hands to either weave it stronger or to pull and unravel the fabric. Because the essence of rule of law lies in its ability to protect the vulnerable and to hold the powerful accountable. In the nearly, I mean, by February, it'll be my 38th year as a journalist. In all those decades, our task, our mission, is to hold the powerful to account because absolute power corrupts absolutely. That actually is true. So law, rule of law, is a fundamental pillar in any democracy. It's a beacon that guides our societies towards progress and equality. That is in your hands. Today, though, truth is under attack. We're engulfed in an information war where disinformation, these are the bullets for information operations, they spread like wildfire to obscure and change reality. What power used to consolidate power is technology, social media. In 2018, MIT released a study that said that lies spread six times faster on social media than those really boring facts. And what Rappler data has shown is that those lies spread even faster if you lace it with fear, anger, and hate. All of us human beings have two systems of thinking. Thinking fast, this is the instinctive, emotional part of us, the amygdala that goes back to when when we were cave men and women. Um, and then the second part, this is what Daniel, Man Daniel Kahneman called thinking slow. This is our rational mind. It is what you have used as a law student. It is where rule of law, where journalism, where democracy happens. Technology hacked our biology, right? Hacked our emotions to bypass our rational minds to trigger the worst of who we are, and to keep us scrolling for our attention. This is the attention economy. Your attention is commodified, changing how you feel, what you think, and how you act. That fundamental design choice to make lies spread faster, a business model we didn't have a name for till 2019, a business model called surveillance capitalism, that choice to spread lies faster turned the world upside down. At the Vatican, I, I told the cardinals, I mean, isn't it against the Ten Commandments to lie? It was good to say it at the Vatican. Uh, but, you know, like in Netflix's Stranger Things, we are living in the upside down. And while all of this seems deceptively familiar, Everything is covered with goo. It's like the heavens opened and the thunder, the, the thunder came, and everything is distorted, and there are monsters at every corner. Because that design of the new gatekeepers to our public sphere was exploited by authoritarians. If you convince people that lies are facts, you can control them. That's what we've seen all around the world. 
Without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, we have no shared reality, no rule of law, no democracy. Those three sentences I've said over and over, based on data since 2016, I said them at the Nobel Peace Prize. Journalists, human rights defenders, anyone under attack, we are defenseless against this information warfare because that is what it is. And at this time, the move for profit and authoritarians using this technology to consolidate power, they align. The same methodology used against me and Rappler, against some of the people on the stage, is used everywhere around the world. Bottom-up exponential attacks on social media. In my case, I was getting an average of 90 hate messages per hour. Pounding a lie a million times that becomes a fact. And then the same thing is said top-down, in our case, from President Duterte himself. The meta narrative was journalist equals criminal. In 2016, that came bottom up. Then a year later, in the State of the Nation address, President Duterte said the same thing top down. A week after that, we got our first subpoena 14 investigations in 2018, 10 arrest warrants for me <laughs> beginning in 2019. Eight of those arrest warrants came in three months. I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I have to just keep getting used to getting arrested just to keep working as a journalist. So what are you going to do? Are you going to serve power? Because it does come down to power and money. Or are you going to hold power accountable? How will you define justice? Which is now part of your oath, right? That's a new thing. And that's a good thing that the Supreme Court added. But, you know, I can't really praise the Supreme Court that much because I have a case at the Supreme Court. I don't want to influence them in any way possible. Even though I've done nothing wrong but to be a journalist, I have gone through every court system in the Philippines. Ask me about the behind the scenes. In the municipal court that refused to grant me bail, all the way up to the Supreme Court, from whom I have to ask permission every time I need to travel outside the Philippines. We're becoming close. <laughs> I plan to come back at every single time of those travels because unlike others, I will face and win these charges. I promise to keep coming back because despite the bad, I have chosen to believe in our flawed judicial system, in our justice system, I have chosen to believe in you. That's the reason I wanted to talk to you today. Our fate is in your hands. I've distilled our experiences in my latest book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator. It's now translated to more than 20 languages, and it's interesting because the countries that have Fascists rising are the ones that first translated, right? From the European languages, Hungarian was one of the first one. Mongolian, this country that's stuck between Russia and China. Portuguese, there was one for Portugal, one for Brazil. Japanese, Korean, Mandarin came out in June, and Arabic is coming out in November. I wrote about the Philippine experience in data, in social media, and how for six years in a row, we, Filipinos spent the most time on the internet and on social media globally. What we went through in Rappler, how the corruption of our information ecosystem, that's what you call lies spreading faster, how that corruption affected our systems of governance in the Philippines, how the law is weaponized against power's targets. I also wrote about these personal lessons and insights, the values, you heard some of them from the chancellor, but the values that mattered, what gives you courage. The first chapter's title is The Golden Rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's whenever I have to make a quick decision, that's really the first criteria because if you wanna be a good person, it's actually really easy. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
Let me share three lessons that I hope will help you as they helped me. The first, draw the line. You've heard me say this a lot over the last few years. The second, hold the line. And then the third, embrace your fear. Draw the line. You sitting there, every choice you make defines who you are. And those choices can sound really simple, you know. Will you compromise here or will you compromise here? Will you turn right? Will you turn left? Each decision will take you down a different path. Will you accept a bribe? Because you've rationalized it's a gift. Character. Your character is created in the sum of all these little choices that you will make, that we make every single day. So be clear. Choose the values that define you. Draw the line where on this side you're good and you cross on this side you're evil. It has to be that simple because our world is chaotic. And part of what helped me as a breaking news reporter was to be that simple, right? When you have to make quick choices, because the smartest people are sometimes the best at rationalizing bad behavior. How much money is enough to keep you happy? I've said this a lot in other parts of the world, and it actually, this quote came from a Filipino whistleblower. Moderate the greed. You don't really know who you are until you're forced to fight for it. And there's something good about that. That's when the pressure is so great that it turns coal into diamond, right? Then every battle you win or lose, every compromise you choose to make or to walk away from. We've walked away from a lot of those. Um, all these struggles define the values you live by and ultimately who you are. Studies show that a code of ethics, oaths, like the one you make as a lawyer, that now includes justice and accountability, that these help us live to our better angels. For me, it was critical, this honor code in my university, where at Princeton, if you, the, the professor hands you the test, then walks out of the room. And you can take that test and bring it to, your, to the library, to the canteen, to your dorm room, as long as you bring it back and sign the honor code at the bottom. That honor code says, you pledge that you, will, you have not cheated, but not only that, that you will turn in anyone else around you that you see cheating. When I came back to the Philippines to head ABS-CBN News, I brought the honor code to our standards and ethics manual. That was the beginning of our zero tolerance approach to corruption. You pledge on your honor not to be corrupt and that you will report anyone else, your best friend, your family, you will report them for corruption. In ABS, it happened. It's possible. It's how we take responsibility for our world, for our areas of influence. Okay, two, hold the line. Our Constitution sets the line for rule of law, right? Your power as lawyers is how you interpret it, how you argue it, and since 2016, I, we've seen some incredibly far-fetched interpretations of the law, that have broken the rule of law. That reflects badly not only on the lawyer, that's, that's there for posterity, but on the institution. I hope to see many of these wrongs now being turned right. New standards are being set, like lawyers who have been disbarred for what they posted on social media. What do we do with lawyers who are spreading disinformation, part of active information operations. That's, that's a, a tool for power, right? In our case in Rappler, hashtag hold the line became our rallying cry. We stood on the line defined by the Constitution 
And despite the harassment, the intimidation we received, the weaponization of the law, we linked arms and we stayed on the line. We made the decision that we would never voluntarily step back from the line. We would not give up our rights because that's what the tyrants want you to do. Makes things really easy if you voluntarily give up your rights, right? In the three months when I had to post bail eight times, match eight times, there were a lot of discussions with our lawyers. It was frightening. We were afraid. I was afraid. So we talked about it. We made a pact among my f the four of us, the co-founders of Rappler. This is Glenda Gloria, uh, Chai Hovilenia, Beth Frondoso. And our pact was to acknowledge our fear, live our fear, but only one of us could be afraid at a time. We had to rotate our fear. You find your ways to cope, right? Which leads to the last lesson I want to share with you, embrace your fear. Fear was a tool of choice of President Duterte. He told me so in, his, in the interview I did with him soon after he took office. Fear spreads. It is debilitating. But fear is also a luxury. If you are in the middle of chaos, you need to stamp down your fear so you can have clarity of thought. If you need to make a quick decision, that is critically, that's essential. So you make the right decision. So whatever it is you are most afraid of, now while you're sitting here, think about it, hold it, embrace it. Because once you do that, nothing can stop you. People will try to coerce, to intimidate, threaten you, to get what they want. Often, it comes down to power and money. And you have to be clear about what you're afraid of because those are the buttons they will push. It took me more than a month to confront my fears. It doesn't help when Amal Clooney tells you you can go to jail for more than 100 years, right? My fears of jail, of violence, but seven years after the attacks began, seven of the 10 criminal charges are gone. This January, Rappler and I were acquitted of four criminal tax evasion charges. It just took four years and two months. I hate that the baton, this baton that was handed, the leadership of a news group was passed to me at this crucial moment in time, but I also know I'm not gonna drop it. That's, I think that's where courage comes in. It's a simple choice and a commitment. Let me end with the power you have. Your choice, your commitment. In your pursuit of justice, you will encounter dark forces that aim to silence anyone who dares to speak truth to power and there will be consequences. Under the last administration, more lawyers were killed, for example, than journalists. The path you have chosen will not be smooth because the powerful now have more tools to crush dissent. But here's what you have to remember. Justice does not cower in the face of oppression. It emerges stronger, coal turning into a diamond. It is more resolute and you come out more determined than ever before. That's what happened to us in Rappler. Corrupt people will tell you that you have no choice. You can't succeed in the Philippines if you're not corrupt. Well, that's not true and don't believe it. All of the government's actions against us, the online attacks, the threats, the legal cases, all of these were meant to frighten me, to make me so afraid that I wouldn't, wouldn't be me 
right? That's what I realized what was happening. So here's what I've learned. I've learned that you always have the choice to be who you are. I choose, as I always have, to live by the values that define who I am. I will not become a criminal to fight a criminal. I will not become a monster to fight a monster. As lawyers, you hold immense power, not just in the courtroom, but in the hearts and minds of the people you represent. Use that power responsibly because every decision you make, every case you handle, has far-reaching consequences today, right? These are science fiction times. It is beyond creative destruction. It's existential. So you have a great role to play. Finally, like the justice for the baby, don't forget your humanity. Embrace your role as advocates for justice and let it guide your actions with compassion, with empathy. You are who you are, right? So, welcome to the battlefield and I hope welcome to the front lines. Congratulations class of 2023. Maraming salamat, Maria Ressa.